Awesome. Hey, Kevin, how are you, man? Thanks for joining me. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I know we've been kind of talking back and forth for a while about getting something like this done and I'm glad we can finally uh, link up and have a good conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to, uh, to make this happen. Yeah. You know, it's, it's no trouble to me at all. This is, <laughs> this is something I weirdly look forward to, you know, I mean, obviously I don't delight in the kinds of conversations that we have because I talk to a lot of people who are suffering from a lot of things, but it gives me, I guess, kind of a mission, if you will, you know, to, to kind of share some of these stories and, and spread awareness. So I'm grateful for that, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful that people like yourself are willing to open up and share your, your stories with me. It's been a long time. It's, uh, actually, my wife started me on sharing the story, and ever since she did, there's been a, a huge reply, so I figured I would uh, take the next step further and uh, try to uh, share some more to see if we can't, um, we can't help other vets and uh, family members who have lost their loved ones due to uh, what we're going to discuss and talk about today. Yeah, so with that said, you know, I guess we'll jump right in. You know, the topic of the conversation is burn pits. And you know more about that than most people. You run several Facebook groups and you're involved with several organizations. So really what I'd like to do is I'd really just like to hear your story. Just kind of in your own words, start to finish. Okay. Uh, Well, I joined the military in 1995. Um, My first deployment was in 1996 uh, before September 11th even happened. So I'm kind of in the middle between the Gulf War and 9-11. After that, I went so I went to Jordan in 96. I went to Saudi Arabia in 98. Between there, I did a stint in Osan Air Base, Korea. And then I moved on to uh, right after September 11th. Uh, it was all hands on deck for kind of going into our uh, higher threat alerts uh, at home station and then moving on to uh, a deployed location where it started the burn pits in Jagopabad, Pakistan in 2003. Um, I was there for about uh, five months, four and a half, five months. Um, and then I hit Iraq in 2006 in between a PCS move from Georgia to Colorado. And then we landed in Kirk Cook in 2006. And at that time, we were on the backside of the, the base, um, supporting in uh, operations with the 5th Cav. Uh, the 82nd, the 101st Airborne Divisions, uh, the 25th ID, and then um, basically we're in the backside where Curtis Village and a Sunni and Shiite Village were located uh, a couple clicks down the road from us, and we were making sure that uh, guys got in, if anybody got hit or anything like that during convoys, that we we secured that back area for them to get to get them back in, to get them back to the rears, to be taken care of. And that's where I really think in 2006 is where I got, where I got sick. Um, I was probably down for about a month. Um, I was told I had the Iraqi crud. Um, I'm sure you've heard this numerous times from previous podcasts if you've interviewed a lot of other people. They told me I was, uh, had the Iraqi crud. They told me to shut up in color, get a straw, suck it up you know, all that other stuff. And the guys were looking out for me. My guys knew that something was wrong because I was probably sick for about a good month, month and a half. And they knew if I went and got more help and additional help that I would probably be sent home and we would lose another body. Because by that time that I got sick in June and July, we were only a month or two out before transitioning back to stateside location. Um, When I got back, I did my post helmet or uh, post health assessment survey. Uh, I told them the kind of things that I was exposed to. Um, Again, wasn't taken really serious. Um, Just kind of pushed off because, you know, um, a lot of people don't understand and don't have the ability to understand what, what we see and what happened while we were there. Um, So I, uh, I deployed again to, uh, in 2008, I deployed to Balad. Um, in support of, uh, you know, again, Iraqi freedom as well, um, where the or the biggest, largest burn pit is a 10 acre uh, burn pit operation on the base in Balad. So I went from kind of bad to worse um, in that aspect of it, I guess you could say, uh, you know, living up there, 
living out there, getting, I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine you in your backyard digging a hole and burning your waste, your trash, all that stuff, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and having your kids go outside and play. You know, um, you wouldn't do that, nor is it, nor are you allowed to do that in the United States. So, um, you know, and living in that environment, working in that environment, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we go from the hooch to the showers. As soon as you came out of the shower, all the soot and the ash would just fall right on top of you, you know, from that smoke and, and inhalation and stuff like that. And then, um, I got back again, did my post helmet sur or post assessment survey, uh, went on to, um, you know, kind of riddled the same, you know, information at that point about what I was doing there. Um, again, got the cold shoulder kind of got ignored. Um, just told I had uh, this time I went to the medical facility. They just told me I had asthma. It was allergic rhinitis. I've been diagnosed with probably about 25 different things than the actual thing of what it is. And the thing with me is, is I'm the anomaly because I'm a non-smoker. They can't figure out why now I have the lungs of a 91 year old and I have constricted bronchiolitis at this point. Um, because, you know, being a non-smoker, they want to say that, um, you know, the smoking guys, or, or it's just because you self-induced it, you did it yourself kind of thing. So um, long story short, I deployed a couple more times. I kind of fell under the radar. I started to having issues with PT tests as far as doing the mile and a half run. I used to be able to run like three and a half miles, do the 5Ks, the 10Ks without a problem. Um, I started noticing I couldn't catch my breath. I felt like I was like a fish out of water basically with the first, I mean, probably the first 150 feet that I would start running. You thought I was, you know, going to, fall over and, and have an asthma or not asthma like attack but it was 10 times worse than that I mean it was just at that point it was just I couldn't even control my breathing um, had a hard time uh, doing that and then um, I got exempt from the runs a couple times um, and then I deployed a few more times um, I'm a lucky one because I made it to retirement before I was actually going to retire I got called about probably a week after I pushed the button, because you can push the button in retirement about a year before you actually retire. And they said that they were going to med board me um, because they, that, that, and that I, because of my restrictions and I started falling through, and they said I fell through the cracks as far as getting, uh, getting the service. And I'm like, well, your med board lasts about 24 to 48 months. I've got about 11 months to go before retirement. So what do you want to do here? And they basically said, they called me back about a week later and said, well, we're going to let you go ahead and retire. Um, so um, I know I noticed activities with my kids were, uh, were few and far between where, you know, you couldn't go out. I couldn't, I couldn't hardly have a hard time going outside uh, being able to have uh, what strenuous, strenuous activities, uh, walking, uh, short distances, running anywhere, you know, kind of just catching up with my kids, you know, because they, you know, if you have small children or toddlers, you understand that, you know, running after them is like a daily, a daily process. So um, after I got out of service, uh, I retired. Um, I started uh, trying to figure out what these burn pits, you know, did and what, you know, trying to get some research about burn pits. I found this group called Burn Pit Families. Um, they recommended Dr. Miller, which is in Nashville. And at that time, I moved up to Tennessee because that's where my folks were. Um, I moved back up to Tennessee. I retired out of Georgia, moved up to Tennessee. So I'm about 200 miles away from Dr. Miller. So I thought, sure, I'd go down there and, you know, see what he says. Um, and, uh, you know, the VA didn't have a pulmonology pulmonologist for me. Uh, in Johnson City, Tennessee, and they sent me to the VA Choice. They sent me to a pulmonologist. I had the letter, uh, the environmental letter from uh, Balad in 2006 that was done. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but uh, um, I showed him that. I showed him all my medical history because basically I, I took about four or five hours to separate my conditions to uh, show what I had. So he said, well, that sounds really bad. 
I'll have to do some research and I'll see you in a year. Well, I didn't accept that see, see me in a year when he had no answer. So I found out about Dr. Miller and I went to him and he saw me about six to eight times during that first year. And um, I found out I was a candidate for a lung biopsy. And when they did the lung biopsy on me, uh, when they cut me open, they went, uh, the doctor told my wife that as soon as they opened me up, they saw the soot and the ash and all the burning and the, and what? The, plaque. the plaques all over my lungs. And uh, they knew right away, without even having to go any further, that I was, you know, was uh, going to be diagnosed as constrictive bronchiolitis. So um, I took care of that. I'm on I'm on oxygen now, as you can see. I don't know if you can see the tube or not, but uh, I'm on oxygen um, day and night. No, nighttime is full time. Night daytime is depending on how much exertion I do. Uh, to be on or what happens during the day. And then I'm on breathing treatments and I'm also on uh, inhalers. And again, if it wasn't for finding Dr. Miller and uh, dealing with him and his experience with the burn pits, because he's also testified in front of Congress and he's dealt with the guys out of Fort Campbell where 38 out of 49 guys came out of Fort Campbell with the same diagnosis uh, when he first started this back in the early 2000s, mid 2000 range um from fort campbell so it's been it's been a uh it's been a huge issue um with that and you know not knowing much about it not hearing much about it uh dr miller told me i was his first air force guy that he's ever dealt with so it's kind of you know um it's been a it's been a trial and error it's been finding people finding resources it's been doing a lot of research uh, to get us to where we are right now and to get people the help that we need and I need and um, battling the VA, uh, you know, with, um, with believing my story, with understanding my story. Um, I did a SEER scan as well. I went to Littleton, Colorado, and I did a SEER scan um, where they also found toxic inhalation in the part of my brain in which I sent you that, uh, I sent you that bit of information there as well. Um, so not only do you have it in your lungs, you have it in your brain because you've inhaled it, which makes sense, but there, that's the only place that allows for the toxic inhalation. But the problem with a lot of guys, uh, the problem with a lot of guys is, is they don't have, when they come out of the military, if they don't retire, they don't have that insurance to be able to go to these places and get that kind of help and take care. I mean, my lung biopsy was over $67,000, you know, out of pocket, you know, that you know, I had separate insurance at that time. The SEER scan was about 33. You're looking at over a hundred thousand dollars just for those two, just for those two tests. And if you don't have separate insurance and if you don't have a way to get, you know, insurance, uh, depending on what you're doing with your job and, you know, these guys are coming out of the military, you know, you have to accept what the VA is telling you and the VA is telling everybody pretty much the same story is that you just got asthma, you know? So, that's basically my story in a nutshell. I mean, I'll give you a little bit of information um, uh, as far as we go on down the road with other things that have happened and other things that I've found out, but uh, that's basically the, the nuts and bolts of what started this whole process. Yeah, I've heard that story a couple of different times, a couple of different ways from a lot of people. Um, usually it's, it's all the same, constrictive bronchiolitis as a result from burn pits in, Iraq mostly, but sometimes Afghanistan. Um, Balad is notorious for Air Force because obviously it's an Air Force base, but also one of the bigger dormitories was just yards from the burn pit. So it was, uh, like you said, it's a 10 acre burn pit and all day long you're breathing that stuff in and you know, they're not filtering the air to the degree that would be required for the air inside, you know, the dormitories and things like that to be considered safe. So it's just inside, it's outside, it's, uh, it's, it's just lingering everywhere and you just can't get away from it, you know, and constrictive bronchiolitis, in my understanding is that's a terminal condition. Is that correct? It is. That's a terminal condition. Right now I'm at, I, I'm at the three year mark. I'm kind of in the red right now. Um, I actually go back to see Dr. Miller on the 13th of October to do a, a pulmonary function test uh, to see where my lung volumes are at this point. And basically, 
the extent of it is I'm looking at a full lung transplant. Um, if not now, soon, you know? And um, so that's kind of the items that are going on um, with that. So, it, I mean, it, it's a serious thing. There is no, it's a compassionate allowance for social security, for disability, but you know, if you look at 38 CFR, the burn or for the ratings for the VA, um, it's not on there. That's why we're trying to pass some bills and get the bills identified for um, presumption of conditions uh, for legislation through Congress right now. Um, that's what we're working on. Um, I'm excited to join with uh, Burn Pit 360 um, as well. And we went to Capitol Hill with uh, John Stewart and John Feel from um, Feel Good Foundation to uh, and Senator Gildebrand and uh, Congressman Ruiz and uh, actually the former VA sec the secretary of the VA uh, who just uh, resigned previously he was there as well um, to advocate for burn pits and it's pretty much been ever since my wife shared my story because I felt like I was I was still alive, so I didn't have it bad as everybody else does. But as I'm going through this and talking to families and talking to other vets and stuff like that, it's been a huge positive response because the biggest thing I want everybody to know is this is not about me. This is about all of us. This is about everybody who's been affected by burn pits. There's over 209,000 vets who signed up for the burn pit registry. Um, and they told me that burn pit registry through the VA wasn't going to go anywhere, wasn't going to do anything. Um, so it's just going to sit there in cyberspace and spin um, those 209,000 vets plus their families, plus the families of people who were diagnosed previous to that even happening uh, and don't even know. They deserve health care. They deserve to be help taken care of. They deserve to have some kind of explanation, some kind of help, some kind of treatment uh, for this problem. Yeah, absolutely. You know, our veterans deserve the best care that we can possibly give them. They put their lives on the line to defend the country, and the least that we can do for them is recognize the service-connected disabilities and cover the medical costs. And for most of the people, that's not the case. Uh, there are many veterans who are going completely bankrupt just taking care of their own medical care that is a result of their service. The VA offers them nothing, and that's a tragedy. It sure is. It's, uh, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of people have gone through bankruptcy. They've lost their homes. They've lost their cars. Um, they're getting the, um, the collections notices from medical places because they're trying to get help. Um, the VA told my wife and I that we blindsided them after we had the lung procedure because we needed to get oxygen. Um, I paid for the oxygen out of pocket at first. Initially we did. And then the VA started to pick it up, which was, we were, we were thankful for that after, after they sent us for further testing. Um, they said that we blindsided them. And my wife said, well, if it was your vet, would you want him treated appropriately as well? And then they basically shook their head and said, yes, we would. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword as far as that goes. But, uh, you know, um, and that's why we're pushing these bills and we're going to Congress and, you know, John Feel and John Stewart are on board with us now. They're the ones that helped the first responders for 9-11 and uh, New York City um, they, to get their benefits and their, uh, their conditions taken care of. And that's why he's, uh, he's jumped on board with us. And um, we're at this point now where we've got over 225,000 signatures for a petition to help with these burn pit issues, uh, to show Congress, to show um, everybody that uh, we're serious about this, the family members, uh, friends of friends of families all across the board. It's not a political issue. This is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. This is not a independent issue. This is an American issue with American vets and American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that have all deployed in, in, uh, in support of the Constitution, you know, and uh, to defend the Constitution against all, all people, foreign and domestic, you know, and this is what we got. We had the enemy in front of us. That's what we're always taught. The enemy's always in front of you. You know, clear your six, and the enemy's always in front of you. 
and here we are burning toxic lead body parts feces uh tires vehicles medical waste human waste uh just poisoning our guys and our soldiers and, and you know women and men and women who you know are uh you know trying to protect our freedoms abroad yeah yeah it's a it's a shame is what it is you know and we can't let it just happen we got to do everything we can to fight you know and i'm glad that you're so on fire about this and you're hooked up with burn pits 360 and john stewart and you know senator you know gillibrand and, and all those other people because it's going to take a lot man i don't know if you're familiar about the agent orange thing um but you know the guys fought the agent orange thing for 40 or 50 years before they finally got some traction and, and, and we are i'm sorry go ahead oh i was gonna say yeah and unfortunately it comes down to to money um i hate to say it but at the end of the day every single bill that gets passed goes through the government accountability office for you know checks and balances and it really comes down to money and if the the money were there then they would say yes but the money isn't there because it would bankrupt the va but you know then we look at things like the government printing two trillion dollars for covid relief right uh and yep. giving 60 billion dollars to boeing and lockheed and all this other stuff and yet, you know, the 200,000 vets on the burn pit registry can't get recognized. You know, it's things like that, that we got to change. And the only way to do that is to keep talking. Well, you know, and, and, that's, and that's a huge thing, like you said. Uh, to go back to your thing about the Vietnam vets, we are partnered with the Vietnam Vets of America through Burn Pit 360 to basically, um, instead of reinventing the wheel, we have copied their uh, lead as far as getting the, uh, the bills along with the uh, first responders from 9-11 um, from to copy their bills and copy their ideas about how they were successful. We have uh, kind of done our due diligence as far as uh, our lessons learned. I mean, there's still vets from Vietnam that are not getting their, their benefits still to this day. And, and it and it burns a fire in me just to hear about them and and it's upsetting it's really disappointing but i think what really helped us i mean this has been a 10-year fight now we just had our 10th year anniversary from starting this fight uh with burn pit 360 it's now 10 years and they don't want to repeat they don't want to repeat the uh the 40-year or 50-year battle with uh with the guys from Vietnam and stuff like that. They don't want to repeat that, but it's going that way. You know, um, I, but I think social media, I think the internet, I think a lot of research and development and being able to talk to people, Facebook, uh, you know, Instagram, you name it. Um, when you start sharing this stuff and it affects somebody just like anything else, if it affects you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to, you're going to take, you know, you're going to take it and you're going to be like, wait a minute, that's me. That sounds just like me. Why is that guy any different than me? What, why is that guy better or worse than I am? And then we start talking to each other. Let me tell you, I have done, ever since I got back on the 15th of September, my full-time job has been responding to vets and I love it. I am so honored and privileged to be able to respond to all these uh, men and women who are having the same issues, who are having the same trope. Now, albeit that's not a good thing to have these kind of issues, I will tell you that. But we're talking and we're getting out and we're getting our frustrations out. We're getting our anger out and we're turning it to the side where it needs to be pointed. And that's to get help uh, for one another and take care of one another because we were all we got. You know, we always had a battle buddy in the service. We always had a, you know, um, somebody to have your six and stuff like that. And, you know, these guys, these men and women are coming out, um, you know, not having anything. And next thing you know, you're hearing these stories and we're sharing stories. I'm no better than anybody else. I, I am not better than anybody else. I am no worse or no better than anybody else. My wife decided to share my story under my, I mean, I told her for many years to hold off, wait, you know, don't say anything, don't bring it out. Because like I said, there's guys dying of cancer. Um, I've got several instances of, I've got a gold star family from the state of Michigan who, 
their son uh, passed away in March of 2020, and they couldn't even have a 21-gun salute for him at the cemetery because of this COVID. Um, you know, and he was 39 years old. He was uh, National Guard in the Air Force, deployed twice to Iraq, twice to Afghanistan, um, came back, uh, was a school teacher and a firefighter, and died of bile duct cancer at the age of 39. Let me tell you, my heart bleeds for that family. I'm in tears all the time hearing about that family, let me tell you. And I'm talking to his mom and the stories and just the, just the appreciation that she has for me to be able to share my story and advocate. I'm honored just to be able to tell her that I know her, you know, and it's, it's awesome. But unfortunately, it's not a good situation at why we met, you know, but uh, it's not like I, I moved in next door and she brought me over a pie to uh, say welcome to the neighborhood, it's, it's not a good thing. This is not something that, you know, needs to go away, needs to be hidden, needs to be swept under the rug, blame it on something else, blame it on more science, blame it on uh, not enough research or whatever the case may be. When you've got doctors and, and hundreds of medical professionals saying that when you burn rubber, rubber on tires, that creates, a chemical that chemical is not good to ingest you know and and the one major thing that we've got with both 9-11 and the towers and with the burn pits is jet fuel jet fuel was the was the one that that the accelerant that made it all come up you know blow up you know we're, we're burning bullets we're burning everything and when the military and kbr or halliburton sign that little hold harmless agreement that's got to tell me any logical person that guess what probably something's not right if they were if they were going to sign a hold harmless agreement with one another that whatever they were doing it's not right yeah yeah it's it's not right you know and there's no accountability um and the government goes out of their way to make sure there's no accountability we can't sue the federal government we can't sue kbr because they can't be held uh, responsible for what they did on behalf of the federal government because they had total complete immunity via that agreement you mentioned so the only real option is to to take it up the chain you know and, and try to get as many congressmen and senators as we can on our side to to champion these bills you know we need a burn pit act just like they had a blue water navy act which was helpful it didn't do everything yes. it needed to do it was helpful but it's still still much work to be done you know and john stewart is a great advocate that you guys have you know i saw him on capitol hill for the 9 11 stuff and it's hard not to get choked up when you when you see him talk because the guy's genuine right we, he's right. a comedian he's an actor Right. You know, that's his professional stuff. When you listen to that guy talk, you can tell that he cares, you know, and he wants nothing more than to just fix broken systems and help people. So well, you guys when, could not have a better advocate. When I talked to John Stewart, I actually met him and I showed him my results from my receiver scan. The first thing he said to me, and there's no scientific evidence. Are you kidding me? You know, you can tell when somebody's genuine. You can tell when somebody's there just for political or just to try to get their name on or face on TV. And, you know, there comes a point in time where, um, you know, uh, you can tell John Field is another advocate. That man takes no, no, you know what, you know, I mean, he's a New Yorker through and through. He was in the 80s. It was in the Airborne. He was a construction worker. He was a firefighter. I, I mean, this guy almost died because of a steel beam that fell on him. Um, and he's out there fighting for us. He's out there fighting for the first responders that, that, uh, you know, paved the way for us to even start this process in New York city. I mean, it's the same type of chemicals. It's the same type of stuff. It's very similar, uh, stuff that's going on. That's happened to our first responders in New York. That's happening to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine all over the place that these, you know, these burn pits are being operated and people are coming home sick and dying and that's the worst part about it yeah yeah and 
we need to do two things. We need to fix it and then we need to stop it from happening again. So the way we stop it from happening again is to fix the current issue at hand, which is to get you guys recognized by the DOD and the VA. Because from now on, we know that, okay, because this was such a big issue, the military will not do that again. The only thing they respond to is negative pressure. And they stopped using Agent Orange because they know how bad it was. Uh, right. If no one ever said anything about Agent Orange, they'd still be using it, right? But now we know that if we raise enough hell, then we affect real change, not just for recognition, but for actual prevention. Uh, and that's really where the thing is, because how many veterans right now are in other places all around the world? And it might not be burn pits. It might be the next thing that we don't even know about yet. And uh, we got to change the way we think about all well, of these. The problems. dynamic is this. There's 3.5 3. million uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine that have deployed to uh, the theater of Iraq or Afghanistan at one time or another. There's 209,000 that are even on the burn pit registry. That burn pit registry is not advertised. It's not talked about. There would be a whole lot more if it was like, hey, you know, you got to sign up for this thing. You got to get, uh, you know, you got to, it should be automatic, you know, as soon as you get ready to hit your tap briefing. That should be something that should be in taps where if you were deployed during this time to this time and we're got guys, this is going to be a, a problem. I mean, just imagine this at 2012, 2013 going to Afghanistan. Like I did, I was in, I was in Afghanistan in 2013. You know, you got some guy who's just newly to the military in 2012, 2013 time, you know, they're not coming out of there until, 17, 18, 19, you know, depending on if they re-enlist or not, they're not coming out of service for a while. So this problem is not going to go away for, you know, probably the next five to 10 years, at least from what we've done from 2001 until, you know, 2012, 2013 time. So we've got to be able to take care of these folks. We've got to be able to get them educated on the fact that, you know, these symptoms that you're having, if you feel like it's more than just asthma, you know, you got to raise that red flag. But the problem is, is that the problem is, is that, like I said, you know, what kind of wave are you creating? You know, I mean, a lot of guys are, are afraid to come out for PTSD because they think they're going to be treated like uh, they're terrible and they're not worth anything and stuff like that. So it really boils down to listening to uh, the stigma of it, um, getting the help that you need, getting the care that you need, raising the flag. And I think once we get this legislation through and, you know, put through and stuff like that, and we got more people listening to us, I think that'll be, you know, something that really kickstarts um, this problem, this epidemic that's going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and I'm trying to gather all the, the people I can to talk, and I know you've been helping out with that a lot. And I have a couple people who are interested. So I hope that, you know, that works out because the more the better. You know, and I, I don't make any money from this. I just do this because I feel like it's my thing to give back in some way. You know, I'm a veteran. I was uh, Air Force 2005 to 2017. I spent time in Iraq in 2010, um, Camp Victory Complex, uh, Camp Liberty, you know, that whole area around uh, Baghdad International Airport. And you know, the green zone. Yep. Yeah, yeah, a green zone over there on the other side. And, you know, fortunately, I didn't really have anything to do with burn pits, but I know that they're there. Um, I didn't notice one while I was there in retrospect, but I'm hopefully by that time, you know, they changed some things, but I know some guys who spent a lot of time on there and have told me stories about how they've gotten sick. But I just know that the sand alone is enough to make you sick over there. Just blowing right. around constantly. It's in the air conditioners, everything you touch, every surface, all your gear, all your clothes, everything mm -hmm. you just can't get away from it you know and there's the there's the idea that gulf war syndrome was caused either by the malaria drugs the anthrax or depleted uranium well we dropped about a hundred times as much depleted uranium on baghdad during the second gulf war as we did in the first gulf war uh, and right. what happens is when it explodes it atomizes and when it atomizes it just kind of falls around and blows around all over the place you know, so it's blowing around with the sand. So we got that going on too, you know, and that's going to be probably another issue down the road is, you know, what are we doing about all the depleted uranium? Because it's in, it's in bombs, it's in 
uh, it's in grenades and claymores. It's in armor piercing rounds. It's in armor for tanks and stuff like that. You know, there's just a million ways that serving in the military is harmful to your health. And well, and I know I you know war is hell. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say that that war is not something that I mean. You know, believe it or not, not every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine, uh, you know, wants to go to war. If that's what we have to do. We have to do that. But you know, war is hell. And I get that things that things that'll happen, like the depleted uranium and the burn pits, and you got to burn stuff to move on. And and I get that to a time. But when Petraeus was in, and he initiated the incinerators in 2010 that all bases needed to use the incinerators. Like you said, it came down to money and, you know, there's still open air burn pits that are being operated right now. When that directive from Cent or CENTCOM came down saying that they had to use these uh, incinerators and luckily in uh, Afghanistan in 2013, they were using some of those incinerators, but it's the cost, it's the maintenance, it's the operational stuff of being able to do that stuff uh, on a permanent basis. To where they might have to go back and put another pit down there and there was depleted uranium all over there because of the vehicles and the the, air, the planes and all that stuff that we destroyed you know um during the war and stuff that are being on are on those bases that uh that we got to deal with but i mean you know the biggest thing is, is like i've told people and i told i did an interview with uh, uh another another group of people and i told them i said you know a claymore has got uh, something on the front. It's, it says "enemy towards the front." It's almost, it's almost foolproof for the, for us to use the claymore because it says "enemy towards the front," and that's where the blast goes. I never imagined that something behind us would be killing us just as much as the people in front of us would be or trying to be. Yeah. 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 It's unfortunate, you know, but we're doing what we can. So I want to thank you for telling your story today and taking time out of your, your Sunday afternoon. I know football is going on and everything else. And, but I, uh, I appreciate it because I hope that, you know, people are, are watching this and this will catch on and we can send this video to congressmen and share it on the internet and people start to realize that this is a big issue and we need to do something about it. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It's also your Sunday afternoon that you're taking time to do this and, and, uh, like I said, if we're advocating for each other and we're taking care of one another, that's that's the biggest step in the right direction. You know, crawl, walk, run, and I hopefully we'll be able to run towards the finish line here when we get these bills passed to be able to take care of these families, these gold star families, these people who are diagnosed with cancers and are sick and are dying, and at least they have some kind of answers and some kind of way ahead instead of nothing right now so i really appreciate you doing this and you taking your time and uh you know it's been a really uh, privilege and an honor to be able to talk to you today yeah no thank you once again you know i consider this to be a continuation of service for me so no uh no thanks required you know this is a uh call it a a duty if you will you know and i know that you're doing yours so salute you for that all right seth well i appreciate it you have a wonderful evening you too goodbye all right take care Bye bye